And with that, I shift focus over to the United States. It's yet another legal setback to former U.S. President Donald Trump. A jury in a civil case has found former President Donald Trump sexually abused a magazine columnist in a New York department store back in the 90s. But Trump was found not liable for raping E. Jean Carroll in the dressing room of Bergdorf Goodman. The jury also found that Mr. Trump liable for defamation for calling the writer's accusations a hoax and a lie. It is the first time that Donald Trump has been found legally responsible for a sexual assault. What's more is that the Manhattan jury ordered Mr. Trump to pay her about $5 million in damages. It should be noted that a jury of six men and three women reached their decision after less than three hours of deliberations on Tuesday. But Donald Trump's lawyer said the former president plans to appeal against the decision. Let's try and get in a sense of perspective in terms of what this means for the political climate and of course for the women in the United States. I'm joined in by Laura Italiano, who's a senior correspondent of Insider, joins me live from New York City. Many thanks to you, Laura, for joining in. First of all, how important is the verdict in Carol's case for women at large, not just the ones who've accused Trump of sexual harassment or misconduct? Well, that's exactly what uh, E. Jean Carroll, uh, the plaintiff uh, who had this success yesterday, wanted uh, to be known uh, about the case, that it is important for all American women, um, especially those who have been assaulted or or know someone who has been assaulted. Um, it, it shows that nobody is above the law and it shows that uh, uh, justice is possible. This is what uh, E. Jean Carroll is uh, so pleased about. Going through the deposition video, at one point, Trump appears to confuse Miss Carroll for his ex-wife, Marla Maples, a mistake Miss Carroll's lawyers have claimed that undermined Donald Trump's argument that the writer was not his type. It's, that's in fact the words that he used. Whether it's the Access Hollywood tape or the mistaken identity, what were the key aspects of this case that went against Trump? Um, you know, as you know, and as, as uh, you may have heard, uh, Donald Trump chose not to appear at this trial. His, his lawyer explained that, uh, you know, it would have created a circus atmosphere and, and uh, also explained what more can you say other than I didn't do it, which Trump has said over and over again. Um, but the uh, jurors did get to hear two very key um, pieces of evidence in Donald Trump's own words, um, two videos, and one was the Access Hollywood tape and the other was uh, his uh, deposition in which uh, he was asked about the Access Hollywood tape. Um, the uh, tape, as you may remember, uh, quoted uh, Donald Trump in kind of a hot mic moment when he did not realize he was being recorded, uh, saying that um, because he's a star, uh, women uh, let him grab them, uh, not to use the crude term that he uh, used, but basically grab them between their legs. Um, this was precisely E. Jean Carroll's um, a sexual assault allegation that uh, that uh, Donald Trump did this to her. Um, right. Donald Trump, in his deposition that the jurors also see, uh, they did he did not deny the facts of of uh, uh, what he said in that Access Hollywood tape. He he merely said that it was uh, locker room uh, talk. He right. kind of brushed it aside. So um, there was what uh, then the plaintiff attorneys could say uh, was a confession by Donald Trump that this is his M.O., that he does these things to women. Um, and I'm right. certain that that had uh, a huge impact on the juror's decision. Right, Laura, on that note, since we are talking about the deposition video and uh, that Access Hollywood tape, in fact, we do have the deposition video. I'd like to play it out for our viewers before I quickly come back to you to delve deeper. When you said that Ms. Carroll was not your type, you meant that she was not your type physically, right? Uh, I saw her in a picture. I didn't know what she looked like. Uh, and I said it, and I say it with as much respect as I can, but she is not my type. When you were talking back on June 24th, you were referring to her not being your type physically. I correct? saw a photo of her. Okay. And the only difference between me and other people is I'm honest. 
she's not my type. A black and white photograph that we've marked as DJT23. And I'm going to ask you, is this the photo that you were just referring to? I think so, yes. Okay. I don't even know who the woman. Let's see. I don't know who. It's Marla. You're saying Marla's in this photo? That's Marla, yeah. That's, that's my wife. Which woman are you pointing to? No. That's Here. Carol. Oh, is that? The person oh, okay. you just pointed to was oh, Eugene Carroll. Who is that? Who is this? Point. And the person, the woman on the right is your then wife, I don't Ivana? know. This was the picture. Ivana. I assume that's John Johnson. Is that that's Carol? Because Carol? it's very blurry. And, and you, know it's, you know it's not true, too. You're a political operative also. You're, dis you're a disgrace. But she's accusing me, and so are you, of rape. Laura, I don't think this could be more shocking than what we've in fact just viewed. But having said that, Trump is also threatening to appeal. We know that's part of Trump's legal strategy to stretch his cases for as long as one can. Walk us through how much of a delay can one expect in this case now if he does choose to appeal, which is highly likely. Well, you, you can be sure that uh, Trump's defense team is going to throw everything it can at this next what they see as an obstacle um, um, fighting this verdict, uh, fighting the payment of a huge amount of money, five million dollars, even for a Donald Trump, who's a billionaire that's bound to, uh, you know, dent, put a dent in his wallet. Uh, so, yeah, it can go on for many, many months. It, All right. It, it's also very possible that. Uh, it will not be resolved before um, the uh, Republican primary, which is, uh, you know, very right. near upon us. And it's interesting that you um, talk about the Republican primaries. I'm sorry I'm running short of time, which is why I'll have to wrap this up quickly. But let's talk about the kind of reactions that have poured in from Trump loyalists who questioned the jury selection, calling it a joke because it was a New York jury. How are Republicans reacting, especially Republican women? Well, um, I, I can't speak to Republican women, um, and we don't have any new polls out to reflect what happened just yesterday. I think right. we'll, we'll see that in the polls. Um, right now, 60 percent of uh, Republicans uh, choose Donald Trump as, as their front runner. Um, that may well change, and it may change the most among women. Right. Laura, Republicans have stood by Donald Trump and are expected to do so even now. And Yet, will the verdict impact Trump's chances of regaining the White House in 2024? That will remain to be seen. Um, the uh, uh, campaign I'm hearing is already calling this verdict a win. Uh, and you'll hear them uh, push that he was not uh, found liable for rape. And they'll also say it's a Manhattan jury, Manhattan uh, residents are not uh, fans of Trump. I think only about 13% voted for him uh, in, the, uh, in the, last, uh, the last election. Uh, they'll also say that uh, the, the burden of the uh, level of proof was very low. It's a civil lawsuit. This is not a criminal conviction. Mm, mm. Um, so that's how they're going to spin it and, and try, to, uh, try to move on as if nothing happened. All right, we'll have to leave it at that. Many thanks to you, Laura Italiano, for joining in live on this discussion. But that's not all I have from the United States, as the U.S. federal government barrels towards a potential catastrophic default, hopes that the meeting between President Joe Biden and House Speaker Kevin McCarthy will resolve their standoff, do not look promising at the moment. While Joe Biden, on one hand, says that Congress must first ensure that bills due for past spending decisions are paid before he'll negotiate future budgets, McCarthy has retaliated and said that Biden must agree to spend uh, to spending cuts. Now, the US president, however, wants to reduce the budget deficit primarily through tax increases on corporations and higher income earners. By reducing the deficit, Biden's budget would reportedly save $330 billion in interest on the debt. That's what the estimates are. Now, the final decisions on what to cut to meet those limits would be determined by lawmakers as they write the annual spending bills. However, it should be noted that the Republicans have accused the Biden administration of engaging in reckless spending. They maintain that the House Republican majority was elected to serve as a check and balance in large part. More importantly, U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen has warned, she says, that the federal government could run out of money by early June if the Congress does not approve a higher debt ceiling. 
What will this mean, not just for the US economy, but also the global economy and what will be the political ramifications for the domestic politics of the United States? Let's try and get in a sense of perspective. And, and on that note, let me also introduce my guests. I'm joined in by Bernard Whitman, who's a Democrat strategist, joining me live from New York City. Bernard is a former Bloomberg and Bill Clinton pollster. Congressman Bob McEwen, former Republican congressman from Ohio, joins us live from Washington. He was also part of the House Intelligence Committee. Thank you so much, Bernard and Bob, for joining in. It's a pleasure to have you on my show. Bob, President, Bob, my first question is for you. President Biden has argued that the MAGA Republicans are holding the economy hostage by refusing to raise the debt limit promptly. He also pointed out that they did not balk at doing so under his predecessor, Donald Trump. How do you weigh in on that argument? Well, this is the standard procedure. As you know, members of Congress are, are elected independently. This president is elected on his own, unlike the parliamentary system in virtually every democracy around the world. So the, the majority party is the, also the party of the prime minister. In this case, you have a, a party in which the Congress is of a different uh, threshold. And so uh, when, it, when it was the agreement between the, the Democrat Congress and the Democrat president, they got along. When the Republican Congress and the Republican president, they got along. Now, when there's a competition like this, this is sort of standard procedure. It's happened repeatedly, and it will go up until finally they both give in and we'll proceed down the road. You know, but the Treasury Secretary has also reiterated the importance of the Congress raising the debt ceiling. Why can't uh, the Congress, in fact, pay heed to what the Treasury Secretary has to say? Well, of course, they, they've already, the House, Republican House, has voted to do that. Uh, it, it took some of the more conservative members, uh, they had to swallow hard to increase the debt uh, ceiling, but uh, the president wants it even more so. So it's just a question as to how much. And uh, it, it's, I repeat, it, it's really quite quite a, um, a molehill to, to consider this is standard political practice. Right. Bernard, I'm sure you want to add uh, some thoughts of yours as well. But before that, uh, you know, the U.S. president is ready to discuss government spending, but in a regular budget process that's not linked to the U.S. obligation to pay debts incurred by previous administrations and are approved by Congress. Many would ask what's wrong with that suggestion. Well, look, I could not disagree with Bob Moore. The fact is, not only is Janet Yellen warning against this, the American people are warning against it as well. 70% of Americans, we can't get 70% of Americans to agree on anything. 70% of Americans want the debt limit raised to avoid default. I don't know, maybe it's because Kevin McCarthy is being held hostage by his own party, the Freedom Caucus. Mm -hmm. Kevin McCarthy is holding, is being held hostage by his own party. Maybe he wants to hold America hostage and the global economy hostage. I don't know, but let me tell you this. This would be a complete and utter disaster. Bob is underselling this tremendously. This would rock financial markets around the world, number one. Number two, Republicans can never help but overplay their hand. It happens every single time. I was Bill Clinton's pollster in 1995 when, when, uh, when Newt Gingrich overplayed his hand, threatened to shut down the government. That helped elect uh, Clinton for a second term. It happened again, uh, Boehner, uh, in 2017, he was blamed for the government shutdown as a result of debt negotiations. Trump owned the shutdown in 2019. The right. Republicans cannot help themselves. What we ought to do is have a clean bill. That's what 70% of Americans want, up or down in the debt limit. And then we can negotiate on spending. The reckless right. attitude of the Republican Party is a abysmal and it's a, it's a shame. Bob, Shameful. would you like to add to that? Also, Biden has said that mm -hmm. he has considered invoking 14th Amendment to raise the debt ceiling. Is that going to be a workable solution? Well, that, that whole discussion I, I think is just silly. Let, let Bob speak. As, as, as you know, when the Republicans were in and Joe Biden was in the Senate, he voted against raising the debt ceiling. And here's simply the way it works. Your daughter comes home from college and she's run up the maximum amount on her credit card. And she says, I want you to increase the debt. You say, well, look, sweetheart, 
we're only going to increase your borrowing power here. If you agree to reduce your spending a bit, you're going out to eat five times a day. You can only go out to eat three times mm -hmm. a day and I'll give you an additional 5,000. That's, that's all this has to do. There's not, the default is, is merely a, a silly conversation. We have literally trillions of unspent funds in the treasury at the moment. Default is not a question. It's just a question as to the rate of deficit spending and Republicans want to do a little bit less than the president wants to. That's all this is. And it will resolve itself as it always does. The idea that it's some tragic <laughs> precipice is just silliness. Bernard, while you do interject, it's important to also talk about the ramifications. The Treasury Secretary has already notified lawmakers that the U.S. could default on its debt by 1st of June. What would that mean, not just for the U.S., but global economy too? It would send a massive chill across the entire economy, starting in Washington, and going all the way around the world, and you better believe it's going to hit Delhi really hard. It's going to hit everywhere, mm. every market, mm. every country is going to be dramatic. Politically, complete disaster for the Republicans. I don't know what they're thinking. The McCarthy default is going to be the McCarthy's fault. Make no mistake, if there is an actual default, Kevin McCarthy will be held singularly responsible for this. It's happened. Uh, th these types of situations have nearly brought us to this brink before. Every time the Republicans get blamed, I don't understand why he'd want to take that on politically. And by the way, you know, it was just announced that six weeks from tomorrow, uh, your prime minister Modi is going to be visiting uh, and that's true. Uh, yes. uh, Washington. Yes. There's going to be a state dinner for him. Unless uh, we want to have uh, the prime minister and the president of the United States uh, you know, ordering takeout, uh, I think we need to resolve this issue <laughs> because this would be an incredible disaster for the American I don't know if that's a joke or something Party. that India should be concerned about. But Bob, uh, you know, I'm going to ask you to, in fact, hold on to your thoughts before I come back to you, because it's important to, in fact, juxtapose both the opinions. On that note, I'm going to request my producers to play out the reactions. On one hand, we also have Joe Biden and we have Kevin McCarthy. Let's listen into what both the men have to say. First, I just finished the uh... I thought a productive meeting with the congressional leadership about the path forward to make sure America does not default, and emphasize does not default on this debt for the first time in our history. <clears throat> I'm pleased, uh, but not surprised, to hear a Republican minority leader of the United States Senate saying that at our meeting uh, that the United States is not going to default, never has, and it never will. Speaker McCarthy offered a very different way forward. He's proposed deep cuts that I believe are going to hurt American families. <clears throat> Millions of Americans relying on Medicaid for their health care would be at risk of losing that. I mean, I think as an entire country, we've got to have a conversation. There's not one thing that's going to solve this. There are many challenges here. And this has gone on too long, too hard. And I mean, we've got to take the politics out of it. Innocent people are dying, and we're going to have to have that discussion. Well, the president tries to say, okay, I'll do a budget agreement, but the debt ceiling has to be just raised. Well, every way we do this, all the times before, is you do the agreement together. I, I, I tried to explain that to him. You know, the president, when he was vice president, they were the Biden negotiations. The president, when he was senator, he voted against raising the debt ceiling. When he was vice president, our debt was $14 trillion. Today, it's $31 trillion. Bob, it's almost becoming a game of who will blink first. Why can't both, you know, you're, you're talking about two mature seasoned politicians. Why can't they both come on to a common page? Let's not forget that it's, it's a, it's a tightrope walking and the challenge of, uh, you know, doing that balancing act is equally there for McCarthy as well as it is for Joe Biden. Well, th this is simply called politics. This is the way the world works. You don't just walk into a room and sign a document. You negotiate. And it's just that's what, what uh, legislation is all about. They wanted to do it at Easter time, and uh, there just wasn't enough you, support. You, you, on... you very, very, you simplified it, but what's the cost of that negotiation? You're days away from nothing, 1st of June. Nothing. Yeah, I mean, I, I, this is I, what, no, this I is what I politics is. This is what politics no, it is. is. It is, it is, it is, it is. It, 
if you if you have a dictatorship, then you give a budget and you answer it. If you have a negotiation, then you then you agree between the two. And they they tried to do it at Easter. They didn't, it wasn't support. The president didn't have support, so they kicked it until the July fourth recess. July fourth recess is coming up in a couple of weeks, so they set the new date. And let, if they don't do it here, then we'll do it in the August recess. It only works this way every time. This Bernard, is standard do you procedure. think that Republicans like are being hawkish? Bernard, not, gentlemen, let me speak. Bernard, my question is: Do you think that the Republicans are being hawkish? I think they're being incredibly irresponsible. I think they're being dangerously political with it. I think it is unnecessary. I think that the idea of holding the American people and the economy here at home and globally hostage to the whims of Kevin McCarthy, who has, by the way, like two votes to spare, is irresponsible. The idea that somehow this is how politics is, so this is how it always should be, is completely false. Americans are right. sick of it. They're disgusted let's, by let's address it. it Why can't we get the job done? I don't understand. If you understand the Constitution of the United States, responsibility for spending money comes with the House of Representatives. They have passed a budget. The president has done nothing, would not meet with them, and the Senate has not responded at all. So if anybody's responsible here, it's the fact is that we have something on the table passed by the House. The Senate has not acted. Neither has the president. He won't until he thinks he's in his weakness position, and then they'll come to an agreement. Right. It only works this way right. every time. Bob, I have a question. Now, there's, we are talking at a time when there's also talk of de-dollarization, not just in India, but also Russia and China. Uh, and as we all know, that if this financial catastrophe does occur, the weakened dollar could also give a leg up to countries like Russia and China, especially. Yeah, well, I mean, this, I think course, Kevin McCarthy is playing directly. Let, let, no, let, let Bob finish, and then I'll, of course, come to you. This doesn't affect that. What what affects that is the irresponsible spending on the part of the president and involvement in a foreign war in Ukraine in which 83% of all the funding is being paid for by the U.S. government. And then he has put sanctions on people that are using the dollar around the world. That is what has created the chaos that you see that is happening in Saudi Arabia and China and elsewhere taking advantage of it. This None of this would have happened if we not had this president and this incompetence that we're experiencing at the moment. All right, Bernard, if I could have your views in on this. Yeah, the, the idea that, that a Republican is coming on international TV and, and basically giving support to a brutal dictator in Vladimir Putin by saying we shouldn't be involved in that is disgusting. I don't know what happened to the Republican Party, who's always anti-communist, uh, anti-Russian aggression. I don't know what happened to that. And the idea that we should somehow hold America's credit hostage to the political wills of the Republican Party, when in fact Kevin McCarthy has virtually no room to spare, just does not make any sense to me. It is not proper. And by the way, uh, Donald Trump was responsible for the greatest increase in the debt ever. Why? Because he gave billions and billions of tax cuts to people like you, Bob, and me when we don't need it. So if you talk six, about who's responsible for the jacking up in the, first uh, the two debt, years of this administration. Donald Trump. Six trillion dollars well, deficit in, the, in this that's first called, two that's years called, alone. That's, that's, the that's record. called saving the economy from Trump's COVID disaster. All right, uh, oh, Bob, okay. Bob, 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 let's focus for a minute. Let's just focus on the political challenges ahead for both Biden and McCarthy. Uh, we all know that McCarthy has also been taken to ransom to just so the Republicans ensure that slowdown in the spending. At the same time, we know that a debt default and its consequences could be disastrous for Biden's recently announced re-election campaign as well. Uh, what are the political ch challenges that you see for both of them? Well, the, the idea of default is really just so much grilla dust. It, it's, it's, the United States is not going to default, doesn't have to default. It has literally trillions in unspent uh, uh, already appropriated funds. So th that's not going to happen. And it's just a, a, this is part of the, the negotiating process. It's not going to, neither one of, this will not be an issue in three months. All right, Bernard, quickly, 30 seconds to share your thoughts. What are the chances that Congress could pass a short-term debt ceiling increase to defer the crisis? I think what's going to happen is there's going to be a, a fairly last minute in, in a week or so, an agreement to basically separate the two. We're going to have a clean vote on the debt ceiling. And then we are going to have negotiations. And Bob, I, I welcome that. I think we should have negotiations on spending. Those will be separate as they should be. I think ultimately Biden offered to cost some money back that was unspent from, from code relief and, and uh, the Inflation Reduction Act. 
I think we will get some uh, compromise out of that. All right. Uh, I don't think that we should use the 14th Amendment. I think that sets up a terrible constitutional precedent. I'm glad uh, to But I do that. think that we will avoid it. Uh, but uh, I would not put it past Kevin McCarthy because the Republicans, again, overplayed their hand every single time and ultimately paid the ballot box for it. Let's hope the American consumers aren't paying uh, by a downgrading credit.